Coming up next on Arizona Horizon, the latest political news in our weekly update with the Arizona Capital Times. Also tonight, Arizona could be looking at an El Nino weather pattern for later this year. And Phoenix continues to gather input for walkable communities along the light rail line. Those stories next on Arizona Horizon. Arizona Horizon is made possible by contributions from the Friends of Eight, members of your Arizona PBS station. Thank you. Good evening and welcome to Arizona Horizon. I'm Ted Simons. The battle over the budget continues at the state capitol. Here with more in our weekly political update is Ben Giles of the Arizona Capital Times. Ben, it's good to see you. You know, the battle is a phrase. It's, it's a term. And we expected some pushing and shoving, some fighting and biting. This thing is getting kind of serious down there, isn't it? Well, the battle's kind of come to uh, a standstill portion, I guess, where uh, you have six moderate Republicans in the House who are uh, stalling any progress whatsoever because they don't agree with the roughly $9.18 billion budget that the Senate sent to the House last Thursday. They want more spending in areas like CPS, uh, particularly in education. They object to some of the cuts to education that uh, or rollbacks to education that Biggs is proposing. And they actually came out and uh, had an impromptu press conference just a little over an hour ago to say there is no deal still and there's no negotiating to be done because we're not going to stand for these cuts. So basically the Senate had its budget, sent it over to the House, that, Senate, that, that budget a no-go, uh, so much of a no-go that we've now got a group of six Republican lawmakers in the House saying uh, we're serious about this stuff. Yeah, yeah, and six is just enough to prevent yes. uh, House Speaker Andy Tobin from getting the 31 votes that he needs from his Republican caucus in the House to, to send the budget out, maybe back to the Senate, and something that could go to the governor's desk pretty quickly. But it, it appears now, as, as long as uh, this group of, of six moderate Republicans and the rest of the caucus, both in the House and the Senate, can't come to an agreement, uh, there's no end in sight. So when the Senate sent the budget over to the House, did the House look at it and hear the concerns of the moderates and send something, maybe a counteroffer back to the Senate? Not particularly. The, uh, the, the budget as it was supposed to go to the floor on Monday, um, no one really knew who was going to vote how because um, from what we've been told, no one in the House was really counting votes even within the GOP caucus mm. before they sent to the budget to the floor on Monday night to see how it was going to shake out. And it didn't take them long to figure out that there's enough of a block of Republicans in, in their own party that are saying, we can't go for this, we're going to vote against this. Um, so rather than have it be defeated on the floor, they pulled the plug Monday. And then every day since then, it's just been a waiting game to see, are negotiations going well? Has there been any progress? Um, we've been told that the, those six Republicans actually sent a counteroffer to Tobin and Senate President Andy Biggs saying this is what we want the budget to look like. Mm -hmm. um, that was rejected. Uh, and now a counteroffer from Biggs and Tobin, we're told, was sent to the moderate Republicans. That was rejected. So we're going nowhere. And again, this is uh, the post-CPS, the new child welfare agency is a factor here. It sounds like the bigger factor here, though, is education, specifically the idea of public K-12 schools uh, starting charter schools in order to get more state money. Talk to us about yeah. this. Just in the last fiscal year, there were 59 schools operated as public schools by districts that were converted to what are known as district-sponsored charter schools. And the benefit they get is, in addition to having access to the local district's K-12 through education funding, they also get charter school money from the general fund. Um, Senate President Annie Biggs has said that's an inequity, an, excuse me, an inequity in the funding of schools um, because the per pupil funding that a district sponsored charter school gets is then more than a public school student and more than a normal charter, charter school student. So his argument has been if you want to be a charter school, act like a charter school and deal with the constraints that a charter school has to. Yeah, I think it's like a thousand dollars more per pupil. Roughly for, for 1200 these. more. Yeah, yep. and which makes for an interesting argument. You're hearing the Senate president, a uh, very much a conservative, Andy Biggs, uh, opting against school choice? It, it, it was that, and in appropriations uh, in the Senate on Tuesday, you had lawmakers um, actually questioning if there was going to be uh, kind of a competition for students in districts as more and more they anticipate opt for district sponsored charter schools to get more funding um, and and some superintendents who came to testify were were kind of aghast because the the thought is 
school choice and, and innovation in schools, which is what these charter schools are doing, that's exactly the kind of thing that Republicans always talk about when they say that's, this is how we want to improve schools. So to now have uh, the Senate president proposing initially a $33 million rollback of funds for that program retroactive to July 1st, 2013, that would mean those 59 schools would have to go back to being public schools. Yes. Um, but now he's also proposing just a, a more widespread change to the funding of that program that would, would basically uh, discourage any school from doing it in the future. And we should note that one of the uh, major areas that would be impacted here is where a certain uh, lawmaker, her district, happens to be. Talk to us about this because some people see this as retaliation by the Senate President. Yes, and, and in fact the Senate President did say on Monday when he introduced this bill to uh, change the governance, change the funding of district-sponsored charter schools, that he was doing so uh, essentially as a threat to the House where you had Representative Heather Carter sponsoring a measure to take out his rollback of the $33 million that, uh, that, that the president says, I'm not sure we want to spend on this program. Um, her, her amendment did also include a moratorium in fiscal 2015 so that schools couldn't convert, but, uh, and that would give the, the schools and the state a time to study the issue. But it wasn't enough for, for Senate President Biggs and kind of furious that the, the rollback might be removed. Uh, his, his threat is this bill, which uh, Democrats and these moderate Republicans say would be far worse for the program. Yeah, so you basically, you've got Democrats who are saying, go charter schools, Get, you know, move over to charter schools because at least the district gets more money. And you've got conservatives like Big saying, no, no, we don't need to see more of these kinds of charter. And what is the education establishment thinking of all this? Well, uh, the argument from, from Senate President Biggs, too, is this, that this is a, the fiscally responsible thing to do. And um, depending on who you ask, there are estimates that more and more schools, as you said, are going to try and convert to, to gain access to this funding, which uh, admittedly they've been doing because for the past three years or so, billions of dollars has been cut from K through 12 education funding. Yes. But uh, as this program grows larger, um, the Senate president has predicted that uh, in the next three years it could be a, a half a billion dollar budget item uh, that is, is coming from the general fund that he fears Arizona won't be able to fund without increasing taxes. It has a vague alt fuels feel to it from the dim and distant past. Last point here, you, had, you said six moderate Republicans are the factor here. Who are those six Republicans? We've got Heather Carter, Katie Brophy McGee, Bob Robson, Jeff Dial, uh, Ethan Orr and uh, Bob Coleman. Those are our six. All right. um, and they say that they also have a couple of other Republicans who share their concerns in the House, just maybe not willing to go public in a press conference as those six did this afternoon. All right. Never a dull moment. Great stuff, Ben. Good to have you here. Thanks for joining us. Thank you. Meteorologists are suggesting the possibility of a developing El Nino weather pattern, which means that Arizona could be in store for a wetter than normal winter. Joining us now is the state climatologist for Arizona, Nancy Silver. Good to see you. Good to see you. And I'm, 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 just, I'm, I'm just happy to hear that El Nino is a possibility. First of all, tell us, what is El Nino? El Nino is a circulation pattern where we get warmer than normal waters in the equatorial Pacific. And that allows us potentially to get uh, a stream of tr subtropical moisture that comes underneath that high pressure and catches the lower tier of the U.S. So instead of going above us and we just get a dry winter like we've had, we get some of that tropical moisture in here during the winters. Yes. 
And this is because of what, weaker trade winds? What's, what's going um, on? Here? Well, the trade winds move from east to west, and so they weaken, and we end up getting more of the warm water from the eastern Pacific to move over to the central Pacific, or so, the western Pacific to the central Pacific. Gotcha, gotcha. So, so what are meteorologists seeing right now? Um, we've been in a La Nina situation where we're, essentially we have colder water there in the equatorial Pacific, and we're starting to see um, the development of a little bit warmer water. We thought this was going to happen this past winter as well, but about October it just sort of fizzled out and went away. Well, I was going to ask that. Is it possible that we could see an El Nino forming now, and then by the time El Nino is supposed to appear there, then later in the year, it's all kaput. Yes, that's definitely possible. We've it, had that happen. So we have, is, is it likely? Um, I don't know. Right now, the, the confidence that we have that El Nino is going to form is not real high. Um, the the, the uh, Climate Prediction Center is putting out all their outlooks through the next um, 18 months as being equal chances of a wet or dry um, year for us. So the, the idea of an El Nino forming in the southern hemisphere here in the next few months, how does that play into what happens to us again later in the year? What, what is that dynamic all about? Um, it's, it's just the ability to get to tap into that subtropical moisture. And when, when, if we get that, if we, well, we, of course we still have to have storm systems. For right, just right. because we have moisture doesn't mean we're going to get any rain. So we, we really need, it's the possibility of being able to tap into that additional moisture. And, and the rain here in, in, the, in the United States would mean Arizona, California, how, how far north? Um, kind of the, it's the lower tier of states. Okay. I mean, it might catch southern Colorado, southern Utah, but definitely Arizona, New Mexico, Texas, and the southeast as well. Because these are tropical, this is tropical air, does that mean higher snow level, and is that necessarily a good thing for Arizona? Um, if we can get the precipitation at the moment, I, I, I'm not too concerned about whether, yeah. we, you know, exactly where that snow line is, because yeah. if we get a cold enough weather system, then we will end up with snow as opposed to rain. And El Nino's, obviously, right now, we, we would take it in a heartbeat. However, if it's a strong El Nino and it means a lot of storms, you could be looking at some flooding. You could see mudslides, a lot of damage too. Sure, Southern California and, and much of California uh, has that as, as, a, as a big problem for them. We don't quite have as much flooding here from the winter precipitation. And as far as Atlantic hurricanes, do I understand that maybe fewer of those with an El Nino, or, or do we know that? I don't really know that. I'm, I, I, I'm not an expert on that, yeah. so I'm not going to put my neck out there. Okay, and again, still no guarantee of an El Nino, but it's worth watching. Oh yes, it's definitely worth watching, and, and, uh, and, and cross your fingers. And when will we be sure, when, we be, when will we be more sure, let's put it that way? September, October, when we see, has we really swung that direction. But even earlier in the summer, we'll see if we're starting to swing toward those much higher than normal um, temperatures in the sea surface in the equatorial Pacific. Do those temperatures in the equatorial Pacific, do they have anything to do at all with our monsoon? No. Not a bit. No. You know, every year I, I get you guys on and I try to figure out how can we predict the monsoon and you always say there's just no way to do it. We have yet to, to find a way to do it. There are some very short-term teleconnections that happen but they're on the order of maybe 30 days out. Uh, and if we see one of those developing then we can have a pretty good idea that we might be getting wetter in that short period. But at this far, this far out from the monsoon we don't really have a good clue. So El Nino, La Nina and the neutral in the middle mean absolutely nothing either before or after a monsoon season. Right. Well, that's no fun. I know. That's not going to help us all. I know. You can tell us, though, about the next few months here in the spring, and it sounds like uh, we're going to be hot and dry. Um, we're looking like we could be hot and dry. There were a couple models, there were like 23 different models mm -hmm. that, that predict things, and two of them thought we might have a wet May. Um, I'm not going to hang my hat on two of the 23, <laughs> uh, because we couldn't really see why they were saying that. So it's going to be warmer and it's going to be drier than usual or just dry period? Uh, just dry period. We don't really have a signal of wetter, drier, or normal monsoon. Uh, we were really happy last year. We turned out to be a wet monsoon. Yes, it, yes. it sort of started late, but it, it came through. Um, that was good because we've had, this will be our third dry winter in a row. Not only that, but uh, did I read this was the second warmest winter on record for Arizona? I believe it is, yes. So what is going on in, in the grand scheme of things, in the, the, the 50,000 foot view here of our weather pattern, what's going on? Uh, well, this winter we had that huge high pressure that set up off the coast of, of the, off the west coast and that caused all the storm systems to go over the top and then they'd come down on the other side of the Rockies 
and then they'd sweep through and they would suck in that cold Arctic air. So they were really cold and snowy, yeah. and yet here we are under high pressure, nice clear skies, um, sunny conditions. Now was that a La Nina or was that a neutral pattern? This was a neutral this That year. was neutral? This was neutral. Because La Nina yeah. usually ends up with stuff like that, doesn't yeah. it? So we've had wet La Ninas, and we've had dry El Ninos, and we've had really wet neutrals, so you, it's just you know, it's just kind of what the average, but you know, we don't live with average, we live with what happens exactly. each year. Exactly. So as state climatologists, are, are, are you, do you feel more confident every year? Is the, is the science and the research and the data, is it, is it improving every year on this kind of thing? Um, you, we're discovering more and more little nuances with the teleconnections and things, so we'll be able to do a little bit better at, at our forecasting, but when there's no signal there, yeah. There's really no, no way to read anything into it. And as far as the drought is concerned, it continues regardless of El Nino, La Nina, or all points in between. Yes, because we've had, we're somewhere in the neighborhood of the 18th year of drought. And that doesn't mean all 18 years have been drier than normal. We had some really wet years, but mm -hmm. they're just sporadic. So a nice wet winter would be good, but we need several in a row to bring us back. Is there any indication that it's going to end soon? Historically, how long have these droughts gone in Arizona? Um, in the, the mid 40s to the mid 70s was about 30 years. Oh my goodness. So in recorded history, we've certainly had them longer than this. And in, in way before that, in the, in the 900s, there was like a 60 year drought. So we're hoping that's not where we are. Indeed, as far as wetter than normal, do those last as long or is drought usually lasting longer? Mm, I, they're kind of similar. Um, the the, 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 the mid-70s to the mid-90s, about a 20-year fairly wet period. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, before the 40s, we had about 20, 25-year really wet period as well. All right. Well, we'll keep an eye on El Nino and hope for the best. It's good to have you here. Okay. Thanks. Phoenix City officials are conducting community workshops to get ideas and input regarding development along the city's light rail line. The goal, to develop walkable communities that work in conjunction with mass transit. Alan Stevenson is the Acting Planning and Development Director for the City of Phoenix. Good to have you here. Thanks for joining us. Great, thank you. Now, this is not necessarily new. This, this reInvent Phoenix thing has been going on for a couple of years, right? It is. Uh, we are in our second <coughs> year of a uh, multi-year grant uh, effort from the Department of Housing and Urban Development. It's about a $2.9 million uh, grant to work in collaboration with other community partners to develop a walkable uh, transit and development around our light rail uh, stops. I think ASU and St. Luke's also involved in the process? Correct, yes. Now when we talk about shaping development along light rail, what shapes are we looking at and how close to light rail? Uh, well, we're looking about a, a quarter mile around each of the light rail stops, um, and we're looking at a more urban style of development that you would see typical of downtown uh, and other, other large cities where they have more urban and walkable development as opposed to our more typical suburban development standards. Uh, Phoenix has uh, really been a, a picture-perfect city related to suburban development, and this is a look at creating a new option and more of an urban style of development. And, and when people hear about it, the, the, the quote, transit-oriented development, what does that mean? Uh, it's really about creating a development style that has a little bit more building height associated with it, typically a mix of uses, and it's a much more walkable, pedestrian-friendly environment that is uh, easily accessible via bicycles as well, more shade, um, it's a little bit easier to provide infrastructure and services from a city standpoint as well. And I, the focus would be what, from downtown Phoenix to Christown and then what, out again to Sky Harbor? Yeah, there's, uh, it's really kind of two segments, there's from downtown to the city's eastern limits, 
which encompasses uh, uh, East Lake, Garfield, and Gateway areas, and then north of downtown, which is uh, three different stations all the way up to the Bethany Home stop. That one that goes east along Washington, th it seems to me that there are there are stretches where there's there's not a stop for a long ways. I mean, how do you get development and especially the walkable communities, the bike riding, the whole nine yards, when the stops are so few and far between? Uh, well, you have to put in some infrastructure to make it uh, so that people want to walk more. One of the, the key focus of this uh, effort is to increase walkability, and so that's done via natural shade, uh, like landscape plantings, but also via man-made shade from overhangs and things of buildings to make it more walkable and create a more inviting pedestrian environment so that you have small buildings that break things up, a, a mix of uses that create some vitality along the street, and then suddenly what seems to be a very inhospitable walk isn't so. So basically, if you're walking in shade the whole time, there's a coffee shop here and a restaurant there, you don't realize you've walked as far as you've walked. Correct. Okay. Um, investment strategies for the rail corridor. I know that's a big factor here as well. Talk about the commercial involvement and what you're looking for. You're just basically looking for ideas from everyone, aren't you? Correct. Uh, well, right now we're in a two-week uh, planning process uh, where we have our consultant in from uh, out of state and so we have a number of meetings over this two-week period. Our kickoff meeting was Monday night and we had about 250 people attend. Um, and so we're getting a broad spectrum of the community to participate. One of our uh, key partners is the Urban Land Institute as well as Local First Arizona. Both of those groups are focused on business and development, and so they're helping us with that aspect as well. What are, what are you hearing regarding concerns from uh, business and development uh, with what can be done and the challenges of getting things done along light rail? Uh, a couple of the things we're hearing are some infrastructure challenges related to existing uh, infrastructure that's there, like water and sewer, electric, some of those things that we'll have to work through with them. Uh, some of the other challenges are really getting um, you know, development developers to understand a different style of development here and trying to, to get them to focus on, on building something that's a little bit different. It's done a lot of other cities, um, but it's a little bit different here for Phoenix. So we're, we're working through a lot of those issues. You, you mentioned other cities. Are there models in other cities that you're looking at or that you want folks to take a look at? Uh, yeah, there are a number of other cities that have uh, light rail lines that have been successful. Um, uh, you know, there's one in uh, San Diego, Denver, um, you know, Portland. There are a lot of cities that have added those elements to their um, to their downtown areas. And then as you extend out, you have some more of that uh, same kind of urban development. You know, I asked about uh, the input that you've heard from the business community and invest for investment purposes and such. What are you hearing from just plain Joes and Janes out there, the citizens who really want to be a part of this? But again, there, there are stretches of light rail where um, there's not much going on right now. Mm -hmm. Uh, some of the big things we're hearing are is protect our historic neighborhoods um, and kind of come up with some compatible design guidelines so you have that interface from some of the taller buildings to some of the existing neighborhoods, how you make those compatible. We're hearing a lot about making those areas walkable, pedestrian friendly, shade, uh, bicycle uh, you know, friendly in terms of complete streets that the, the city's undertaking as well. Um, you know, we're hearing a lot about also about local first and trying to get uh, local businesses involved uh, and make it successful for them, not just uh, some of the larger chains and some of the suburban shopping style, uh, shopping mall style. And when, when you talk about residential along the line, how close to the line could that be? And what kind of residential are you hearing about? Are you talking about? Uh, for the most part, it could be, uh, you know, it'll be rental, either apartment or condominiums. Uh, it would also be an ownership type of product. Um, and there's also some single family attached style of development that could be built a little bit off the light rail line. That's kind of like a row house you might see in other cities, a little bit more urban, more dense than we see here, but it still allows for an ownership uh, style of development, ownership of the land. So if someone wants, someone has an idea or they want to get involved in this, how do they get involved? Uh, well, we have a website, uh, reinventphoenix.org, uh, that they can go to uh, and find out all kinds of information about this. We also have upcoming workshops, uh, including one tonight. If you're a resident or property owner, tonight at 6 p.m. Uh, at the Phoenix Financial Center, which is the northeast corner of Central and Osborne, we do have a workshop starting at 6 p.m. Um, if you're close by, you can race over there. Sure, uh, yeah. We also have uh, workshops coming up uh, on this uh, Friday, again, at the same place, 6 to 8 p.m. is the midterm report where the consultant's going to give us what they've came up with for this first week. 
Um, and then we have a couple of other uh, meetings next week on uh, Tuesday, April 1st. There's a local first uh, meeting that's being put on about for local businesses. That's 6 to 8 p.m. And then the following Friday on April 4th, 6 to 8 p.m., the consultant will re unveil their designs for the, the final two-week process. And uh, again, all that information is on the website, correct? Correct. Last question, when do the workshops end? When do the workshops end and the action begins, if you will? Uh, so the workshops will end uh, on April 4th, and then the consultant will take that final bit of input they get, go away to finalize the designs and develop our walkable urban code, come up with some parking strategies to help us. Um, and then those things will be brought forward and brought back to get additional public input um, in summer and then adoption by council in the fall end of the year. All right, great information. Good to have you here. Great, thank you. And that is it for now. I'm Ted Simons. Thank you so much for joining us. You. Have a great evening. Arizona Horizon is made possible by contributions from the Friends of Eight, members of your Arizona PBS station. Thank you.